<coughs> this morning's reading is taken from Amos 4, sorry, Amos 5, verses 4 to 27. It's a slightly different version, but if you want to follow it in the Church Bibles, it's on page 919. Now this is what the Lord says to the family of Israel. Come back to me and live. Don't worship at the pagan altars of Bethel. Don't go to the shrines of Gilgal and Beersheba. For the people of Gilgal will be dragged off into exile, and the people of Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Come back to the Lord and live. Otherwise he will roar through Israel like a fire, devouring you completely. Your gods in Bethel won't be able to quench the flames. You twist justice and make it a bitter pill for the oppressed. You treat the righteous like dirt. It is the Lord who created the stars, the Pleiades and Orion. He turns darkness into morning and day into night. He draws up water from the oceans and pours it down as rain on the land. The Lord is his name. With blinding speed and power, he destroys the strong, crushing all their defences. How you hate honest judges, how you despise people who tell the truth. You trample the poor, stealing their grain through taxes and unfair rent. Therefore, though you build beautiful stone houses, you will never live in them. Though you plant lush vineyards, you will never drink wine from them. For I know the vast number of your sins and the depth of your rebellions. You oppress the good people by taking bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Those who are smart keep their mouths shut, for it is an evil time. Do what is good and run from evil so that you may live. Then the Lord God of heaven's armies will be your helper, just as you have claimed. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Perhaps even yet the Lord God of heaven's armies will have mercy on the remnant of his people. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord God of heaven's army says. There will be crying in all the public squares and mourning in every street. Call for farmers to weep with you and summon professional mourners to wail. There will be wailing in every vineyard, for I will destroy them all, says the Lord. What sorrow awaits you who say, If only the day of the Lord was here, you have no idea what you're wishing for. The day will bring darkness, not light. In that day you will be like a man who runs from a lion, only to meet a bear. Escaping from the bear, he leans his hand against the wall in his house, and he's bitten by a snake. Yes, the day of the Lord will be dark and hopeless, without a ray of joy or hope. I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice your choice of peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harp. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. Was it to me you were bringing sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, Israel? No, you served your pagan gods, Sakruf, your king god, and Kawayan, your star god. The images you made for yourselves. So I will send you into exile, to a land of east of Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of heaven's armies. This is the word of the Lord. Pray for Helen. Lord, we thank you for Helen. We thank you for this word that she will be delivering to us today. We ask that our hearts are open to all we hear and that we receive it with the love of you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, after that reading, aren't you glad you came this morning? <laughs> uh, we've recently looked at Amos in our home group 
And when we came to this passage, there was a collective gulp. Uh, but if you look around, there is still one member of our home group standing here this morning. And I know others are still alive and standing. We weren't all frightened off. And in fact, we were challenged in a good way, weren't we, Brenda? But before we think about what God might be saying to us this morning, let's have a look and see what on earth was going on for God to speak to his people in such a way. And we need to do a bit of a history lesson. So we'll start around 1,000 years BC, and you probably know that God's precious chosen people, Israel, had demanded a king, and God gave them Saul. Then there was David, a man after God's own heart, followed by his son Solomon, the wise one. Solomon was followed by Rehoboam. Then the 12 tribes of Israel split into two rival kingdoms, with two of the tribes in the south, named Judah, with Jerusalem as their capital, and the remaining 10 tribes staying in the north and keeping the name Israel. So are you keeping up? So just a bit of a, a help there. So Judah in the south, that's the two tribes, and the 10 tribes are where the green is um, in the north. And so just sort of bear that in mind. So the next king of the northern tribes of Israel was Jeroboam, who, worried that his people would want to go and visit Jerusalem to worship, so going down from the green into the brown to worship, he decided to build two alternative centres of worship at Dan and Bethel. And you can read about it all in 1 Kings 12. But unbelievably, given the anger of God when Aaron built a golden calf in the time of Moses, he too built calf shrines, reducing the worship of God to a pagan religion like those of the surrounding nations. No wonder God was angry. These were God's chosen people whom he had rescued from Egypt, cared for in the wilderness and given them a land of their own, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he'd given them a place of worship in Jerusalem. And really, they deserve to be eliminated straight away. But their God and our God is a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. And once again, he offers his people a chance to repent. And in fact, if you read the whole Bible, it's an absolute love story of a God who has chosen a people to love and to have a relationship with, but who continually muck it up. But God again and again calls them back to himself, calling, that, calling them to repentance and a renewed relationship with him. And it's the same today. We continually muck it up, but our God is gracious and compassionate and continually says to us, seek me and live. But back to our history lesson. It's now about 250 years later, so 750 years BC, and life continued in Israel under Jeroboam II. There was peace and prosperity, at least for many of the people. But in addition to worship at unauthorized shrines, there was rank injustice, with the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Another reason that God was angry and decided to act. God's people were expected to be an example to the surrounding nations of a just and loving God, especially in taking care of widows and orphans and strangers. So God called on Amos, who is a shepherd and also looked after sycamore fig trees, wherever they are, uh, to be his prophet. And Amos lived in the southern kingdom of Judah, and there's no record of Amos being a prophet before or after his prophecy to the northern kingdom of Israel. So Amos set out for Judah, for the northern kingdom of Israel, to speak God's word to those who were effectively their enemies. He was not welcomed. And given the tone and nature of his message, he was a man of determination and courage. And it just reminded me of maybe somebody from Watford Town Football Club coming to Luton to tell us how to manage our players. <laughs> But, um, anyway, he starts off his message by giving dire prophecies against Israel's neighbours. And this was a very clever strategy, as this got his hearers on side. And you can imagine them saying, yes, yes, he's absolutely right there. And he even continues with a negative message about Judah, their rivals. But then, then he starts to prophesy against Israel, his listeners. And the message is far more lengthy and condemning than any of the others. After all, these were God's chosen ones. They should have known better. 
and the saying goes, to those whom much has been given, much is expected. So he condemns their treatment of the poor and exposes the fraud and cheating that's going on and the ways in which justice in the courts is operating. He condemns the complacency and ostentatious lifestyles of the wealthy and most condemning of all for those who consider themselves to be followers of the law of Moses, he says how much he hates their worship. And you can read about all this in the preceding four chapters of Amos. Now at this point, I just want to define what he means by worship. He's not talking specifically about music groups, songs, or even church services. It's about their relationship with him. So Josh, you can breathe again here. So in our reading today, Amos calls the people to repent. God says, come back to me and live. It's a heart cry from a God who loves his people but cannot stand their behavior. Amos then lays out the consequences if they continue on this path as a nation, bringing God's judgment to a terrifying conclusion. If they don't return to the Lord and mend their ways, they will be destroyed. And from our point of view today, we can see that they clearly didn't turn back to God as the people were eventually taken into exile into exile, and the religious nation of Israel, the ten tribes, ceased to exist. And you might be wondering, how come we've got a nation of Israel today? Well, if you read on in Amos, you'll see that God promised a faithful remnant of the nation would survive, and these were members of the family of Israel rather than the nation at that time. So, okay, let's just take a breather here. So it's holiday time, and some of you have been away, and some of you still have a holiday planned. We have. Uh, Or maybe you're off to visit family somewhere else in the UK. And whatever your plans, it's often that time of year when your car, which is often taken for granted, maybe gets a little bit of TLC. So how many of you, before going on a journey, send your often neglected motor off to the garage to have its tyres checked, or your water, or your oil, Or you might send your husband to do it. Or I'm glad you're here, Lee, because you were always the one who said to me, your tyre needs attention. (laughs) So you've not seen that the tyres are flat, but it's good to check it out just in case. And when it's your car's yearly MOT, you often send it off to the garage, pretty confident it's going to pass, but it's good to check just in case. And for ourselves, the GP might call us in for a routine test. Not that we think anything is wrong, but just in case, it's good to check it out. And that's what I think our reading is saying to us here today at Christ Church in Bushmead. We're about to embark on a new journey, as we've heard this morning. Tim and Amanda should now be safely ensconced in the vicarage, and we're all looking forward to the 4th of September, when he'll be officially become our new vicar. It's a new phase in the life of our church, the beginning of a new journey for our community, for our church, and for each one of us as individuals. And it's a very good time to have a spiritual checkup. So what should we be looking for if we do a checkup? Let's start by looking at injustice. In our passage today, the Lord condemns the rich in their wonderful houses while poor people suffer. There's corruption, fraud, and perversion of the course of justice. Those who were rich believed their material blessings were a reward from God, but this couldn't be further from the truth given the message Amos delivers. And today there are some elements of the church that preach a prosperity gospel that if things are going well for you, then you must be being blessed by God. But Jesus in the New Testament reinforces the teaching that our wealth is not as important to God as it is to many people today. In Matthew, Jesus says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Elsewhere, and you read in Amos, God condemns Israel in no uncertain terms. Just have a listen. The people of Israel have sinned again and again, and I will not let them go unpunished. They sell honorable people for silver and poor people for a pair of sandals. They trample helpless people in the dust and shove the oppressed out of the way. Both father and son sleep with the same woman, corrupting my holy name. 
And he says, my people have forgotten how to do right, says the Lord. Their fortresses are filled with wealth taken by theft and violence. And in this reading, which um, when we're doing this in our home group, Brendan reminded me that all scripture is useful. Listen to me, you fat cows living in Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and who are always calling to your husbands, bring us another drink. <laughs> I know. We had to think about that one, didn't we, Brenda? Um, but it's serious. The Sovereign Lord has sworn this by his holiness. The time will come when you'll be led away with hooks in your noses. Every last one of you will be dragged away like fish on a hook. You'll be led out through the ruins of the wall. You'll be thrown from your fortresses, says the Lord. It's strong stuff, isn't it? It's strong stuff. Why did and why does God hate injustice? Well, fundamentally, he is a God of justice. It's in his very character. Deuteronomy, it says, he is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright is he? So he expected his chosen people, Israel, to demonstrate his character to other nations, to the stranger, the widow, and the orphan, so they might experience his love. And it's the same today. He wants and expects us to demonstrate his character to those we come into contact with so that they will see him as a God of justice and love and want to come to know him. Now, the language of Amos may not be exactly how we see our lives or the lives of those around us. These are big things he's talking about. But what does God think when we don't speak up for the truth? where we're afraid in conversations to speak about Jesus or about what God says is right and wrong, when we don't stand up for the oppressed. And we're not just thinking about homeless or refugees here. What about standing up for a colleague who's been unfairly treated at work? What about when we don't treat those in need with compassion? What about when there's a little fiddle going on and you join in? Or if you're undercharged in a shop and you don't correct the mistake. I know some of you have tried to do this, um, and we have too, haven't we? And the shop assistant looks at you as if you're completely going off your head. But nonetheless, that's a demonstration of, of justice and righteousness and integrity. Do we think about the things that we buy and where they come from? And there's a lot today about fair trade, isn't there? Are people working for a pittance to produce our throwaway clothes? There are many, many injustices in our world and even in our own country, and we just hear about them every day. And it's a difficult one. We can't fight every battle. So what can we do? And if, if lots of people just do a little, then maybe things can change, but we can say we've tried as well. So what are some of the things we could do to make a difference, to try to ensure that we are living lives that are pleasing to God as far as injustice is concerned? And just here are some simple suggestions, but you'll have ideas of your own. So pray for the courage to speak up against injustice and ask God if there's an area he wants you to get involved in. There are some massive campa campaigns against injustice. You've only got to listen to the news or surf the internet. And is there anything that you could support financially or otherwise? Perhaps ask Nigel about supporting persecuted Christians around the world. Could you volunteer for a local charity? And we've heard that this morning. For Noah, Luton Town Community Chaplaincy, the Women's Rights Refuge or Luton Community Money Advice, Street Pastors. There are lots in the town engaging with the poor and oppressed that need help. Is there someone in our own church family that needs our help? And there are lots of petitions that you can sign nowadays. Have a look at Citizen Go on the internet. It's not a Christian group, but many of their petitions are godly and worth signing up to. Write your own letter when you see injustice happening, maybe to your MP or local councillor or even to the Church of England. Look at what you're buying. Now, this is a difficult one. Clothes made overseas in sweatshops are normally cheaper, and not all of us can afford to kit ourselves out at John Lewis. And some overseas workers have pleaded for us not to stop buying their clothes as they would be out of a job. So it's complicated, isn't it? 
So it may be that we can't get involved directly in fighting injustice, but is there something that we can do that redresses the balance, just to sort of tip the scales the other way a little bit? And our daughters have been in, into this a little bit. Um, Heather once bought Brendan a goat in Africa for his birthday to help support a family, to kickstart their sort of ability to support themselves. And Katie, another time, bought him a gift of an investment of a sum of money to help kickstart a small business. I think it was in South America. You could choose, couldn't you? And um, the, the money went into the small business as a loan to that small business. Uh, and then there was a small return which could be reinvested. And at the end of the period, the loan was repaid and it could then be invested into another small business. I think it was something like £50, wasn't it? It wasn't, you know, micro, yeah. Perhaps you could sponsor a child overseas, helping them to get an education so they have the potential to live a life free from abject poverty. Is there something that we can do to make a difference, however small? And perhaps this is something that we can think about as a church later on when Tim gets here. Now, the result of the nation of Israel's treatment of the oppressed and the poor, their obsession with wealth and property, their cheating, fraud, and perversion of justice was that God absolutely hated their worship. It wasn't that their singing was out of tune, or they didn't have enough guitar players, or they weren't singing songs that people knew. It wasn't about how many goats or cows or pigeons they sacrificed, or how often they did it that made him so angry. It was the fact that their hearts weren't right. And here at Christ Church, Sunday by Sunday, or on a Wednesday, or in our home groups, does he mind when we worship using CDs? No, of course he doesn't. Does he mind if the tech goes a bit wrong sometimes? He's not really bothered about that. Does he turn away when a small group does their best to sing songs of worship in someone's home? Absolutely not. Does he mind when our worship doesn't contain any singing or music at all? No, he doesn't. Does he want us to do our best? Yes, he does. It's part of giving everything we are to God. And don't forget that worship, as we've said, in its most complete sense, is giving God what he is worth, not just in singing, but in our attitudes and behaviours. What he does mind is when our words of worship don't match our lifestyle, and that's called hypocrisy. It's when we proclaim that he is Lord of our lives, and then don't want to hear what he says to us by not engaging with his word. It's when we say we trust him and then worry ourselves to death. It's when we sing, as we did last week, that we want to be refined and made holy, but then refuse his discipline. It's when we ask for forgiveness for ourselves, but refuse to forgive others, and the list goes on. It's when we earn a good salary, but decide, decide to spend the money on extra things for ourselves, rather than giving appropriately to God. It's when we come to church only when we've nothing better to do. It's a hard list, and most of us could tick off some of these things. I know I could. Jesus had some very strong words for hypocrites, and he was speaking to and about the religious people. In Mark, it says, Jesus replied, You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And there's a whole chunk in Matthew on a similar vein. When we look at who God is, and Amos pointed the people of Israel to this in today's reading when he said, It is the Lord who created the stars, the Pleiades and Orion. He turns darkness into morning and day into night. He draws up water from the oceans and pours it down as rain on the land. The Lord is his name. When we realise and take a moment just to think about exactly who he is and what he has done for us, then really our worship is just so inadequate, at least mine is. But thankfully, our God looks at our hearts. He knows we are frail and imperfect and, yes, sinful, what he's looking for is a people who will love him, try to obey him, and confess when they get it wrong, accepting his forgiveness. God loves his people Israel, and you can hear that in his words to them in Amos. Come back to me and live. Don't worship at the pagan altars at Bethel. Don't go to the shrines at Gilgal or Beersheba. Come back to me and live. 
And the good news today is that God loves us. He's absolutely mad about us. And he's made a way for us to have a beautiful relationship with him by sending his son Jesus to take the punishment for our sins so that if we acknowledge him as our Lord and we ask for and accept forgiveness, we can have a living and loving relationship with God now and the promise of eternal life when we've finished on this earth. Jesus says many times in the Gospels, come to me. And he says, this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one who you sent to earth. So back to our spiritual checkup. How can we take stock of our lives to ensure that we aren't falling into the same trap as the Israelites as far as their worship was concerned? There are some things we can begin to do. Pray for God to reveal anything to us as a church. We can do this as individuals, but also corporately in our home groups at the intercessions meeting on a Sunday, which I think is next Sunday. And I know it's something the ministry and leadership team are doing. Pray for those involved in leading us in worship. Music, yes, but also praying, reading, leading and speaking. We can be brave and ask our Christian friends if they see anything in us. Perhaps they can see something we are putting before God in our lives, an idol in our life. We can examine our lifestyle. Do we honour God with our money and our time? We can look at our relationship with Jesus. Is it growing? Should we be spending more time reading our Bibles or praying? And the answer to that one for me is definitely yes. Confess where we know we are falling short and ask for God's help. So it's good to do a checkup once in a while, to take the opportunity to make some adjustments, to refill the water or pump up the tyres so that we can begin our journey knowing that we're in a good place. Going on holiday or a special trip is exciting, but it can take some preparation and it can be costly. So as God's people at Christchurch, let's spend some time over the next couple of weeks asking God to show us anything that needs our attention. As we get ready for our new journey, now's the time for a checkup. Amen. Thank you, Helen. Uh, sad, isn't it? All those years ago, um, things haven't changed much, have they? You know, they struggled then and we struggle now. Um, so it is time to maybe look as this new, new season for Christchurch comes to look at our lives. What Helen was saying about think, you know, getting a few pence more than you should or let, at the checkout made me think um, I had to collect a parcel from Next, which I did. I collected it yesterday. And this morning they keep texting me to say, I haven't collected it and there'll be credit in my account with it. And I'm thinking, right, well, now I need to call them and say, I actually have got this parcel. I don't need the money back. Um, so um, just before we have our last song and our blessing, I'm just going to share a couple of things. Um, I know Ellie shared last week about how the Lord had been putting people in her life over the last couple of weeks and Steve last week gave out a little prayer and uh, packets of jelly beans sorry no sweets this week I'm afraid sorry but um just a couple of things that have happened to me over the last couple of weeks um as many of you know I work in London full time so I travel by train every day and on the hottest day of the year it was a horrendous journey back home and I didn't get back it was a long story but to cut it short, I had to go back by a hitchin and I didn't get in till 10 o'clock at night because there was just no trains. Um, the next day I had to go to work. I had to. We were moving offices. I had to go to work. I got to the station. The trains were running. I thought, fantastic. I sat on the train for three quarters of an hour for them to say there's no trains. No trains running at all. Can I go to hitchin and get a train? No, nope. nothing's running and I had to go. And it's the f I had to step out in faith and I drove to London. Now, I have an iPhone, which has not been very happy for the last few weeks. So I had about 50% battery. I had to use it for the sat-nav because my sat-nav was in Milton Keynes with Simon. So um, I got in the I phoned Simon. I said, I'm driving to London. He said, are you sure? 
usually tried to stop me, he didn't actually. I said, yes, I've got to. I prayed all the way as this phone crept down the battery power. I kept praying that I would get to a sign for Hammersmith. I kept praying, just get me a little bit further, Lord. It got down to about 10%. I'm thinking, if this now crashes before I get to work, I prayed my whole way there out loud to myself. I got to Hammersmith and it died as I parked outside the office. And I think that was definitely a God thing. Then last week, uh, last, not Friday, the Friday before, um, the power failure that many of you probably heard about. So I got, I left work early. I got to King's Cross, no trains, nothing going from anywhere. I went for a cup of coffee. Long time ago, I stopped panicking because I thought it just said delayed at this time. Had my cup of coffee, got back down, nothing. No, no trains at all. It was about half seven by this stage. I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. It was raining outside. Why I decided I'd go outside, I don't know, but I did. And as I did, this voice said, hello, Jane, you don't remember me, do you? And I looked up, and it was Yvonne and Pete Saunders' daughter. And the last time I'd seen Yvonne's daughter, she was about this high, and now she's that high. And through her, we got an Uber cab to Pinner to Pete's mum, and Pete drove from Luton to pick me up to take me home. And I really think God is good, like Ellie said last week. He's always got our backs, always. So um, we never need to worry about that. So, so um, it's been a lovely service. Thank you very much. I will say a blessing and then ask Josh and the team to lead us in the last hymn. There'll be tea and coffee at the back. Please stay, chat, talk to each other. So, Lord, may we go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted, honour everyone, love and serve the Lord. Rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.